This Real Egg Radio podcast is brought to you by High Performing Carbine Insecticide from FMC. Carbine Insecticide delivers fast, selective, and extended control of aphids in alfalfa and pulses, leaving beneficials like lady beetles to help in the fight. Ask your retailer today. It's time for Real Egg Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Egg Radio. Hello and welcome to this April 2nd edition of Tuesdays with Lindsay here on Rural Radio Channel 147. It is Real Egg Radio and I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Uh, on today's show, we've got a great show lined up for you. We're going to hear from Marty Verme. He's with the Grain Farmers of Ontario. Uh, he's going to be talking about a new campaign to help farmers be drift aware. That's right. As we head into the growing season, it's super important that we are doing the best job possible on the spray pass. But of course, doing the best job possible also means keeping product where we want it on those target plants and minimizing any off target movement. So we'll be talking about that later in the show. I've also got Paul Bullock is going to join me. He's with the University of Manitoba and he is part of a project that is looking at forecasting fusarium head blight for spring wheat, durum wheat, winter wheat and barley on the Canadian prairies. And uh, this is actually a pretty large project. It's many years in the making and there is a new forecasting tool that will be available starting in May for uh, Canadian producers on the prairies. And it is largely backed up by weather stations throughout the prairies that feed into the algorithm to make up to date, literally up to the day, forecast maps uh, down to a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer uh, square. So if you are going to use this map, you will be able to get incredibly accurate, incredibly precise uh, forecasting for fusarium head blight. Uh, However, one of the reasons I've got him on the show today, A, it's a super cool project, but B, there's actually uh, a need for more weather stations in Saskatchewan to help support the program. So if you happen to farm in Saskatchewan, this segment is for you as far as the uh, ability to potentially access a free weather station for your farm, if you happen to be in one of the areas that needs one. Uh, But of course, for all our growers in Alberta and Manitoba, also important for you because you'll find out where to get this forecasting tool for the 2024 season. Also today, I've pulled a clip from The Agronomist, but not last night's Agronomist, although it was a very good show, but actually one from uh, just a few weeks ago with John Lazon of the University of Guelph and Bryce Geisel. Uh, They joined me to talk about saving nitrogen. Yes, nitrogen loss, huge issue, of course, for productivity, for profitability, and also for our planet. And so we talk about all the different ways we can save our nitrogen. So I've grabbed a clip from that show. Now I'm going to round out the show as promised uh, with some news. We've got several key things happening that uh, I'll touch on at the end of the show, including the latest on the HPAI uh, infection in dairy cattle. We do have word that a uh, human has in- been infected as well. Uh, so this is, of course, a-, a developing story. I know Sean has been keeping you up to date on it as well, but I will check in and uh, bring you up to date on the latest we've got today. All right. As per usual, if you've got any feedback, zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. We'll take your story ideas, if you want to be on the Farmer Rapid Fire, if you've got any feedback or questions, you just zip me an email. Or of course, you can find us across social media uh, at Real Agriculture. We're on YouTube, Facebook, X, TikTok, Instagram, or you can always just head to realagriculture.com. All right, let's take a quick break and I'll be back with Marty Verme of the Grain Farmers of Ontario right after this. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. 
I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. CDC Endure is a new oat line from Alliance Seed. High yielding with excellent disease resistance and the quality end users ask for all in one great oat variety. CDC Endure provides the high beta-glucan levels to make heart-healthy products like breakfast cereals. For more information on CDC Endure Oats, as well as any other products from Alliance Seed, check out allianceseed.com or visit any Alliance Seed authorized retailers. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. It is Tuesday, April 2nd, and I am your host. This segment is brought to you by Invita. Invita bridges the nitrogen gap all season long, enabling your corn crop to fix the nitrogen it needs from the atmosphere when and where it needs it most. Let Invita set your crop up for success by requesting it from your local retailer. All right, it is time to talk about spray drift and how to minimize it. And to have that conversation, I've got with me Marty Verme. He's senior agronomist with the Grain Farmers of Ontario. How are you doing today, Marty? Hey, I'm doing great, Lindsay. How about yourself? I'm doing well. We survived April Fool's. So everything's yeah, fine. I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't, you know, yeah. I really do like how the internet has evolved over April Fool's. Um, in that, you know, it's the one day people think critically about what they see on the internet. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, so of course we are, we're, we're early April. Uh, we're gearing up for the growing season ahead. Uh, Grain Farmers on, of Ontario, with a few other groups, of course, coming out with the Be Drift Aware project here. And I wanted to talk about this. What is this, Marty? Why do farmers need to be drift aware? Well, Lindsay, it's not something that happens overnight. And I mean, for years, there's been, you know, concerns of drift and all the farm organizations that are involved in this, which would be, the, you know, Ontario Federation of Ag, Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association, you know, along with Ontario Minister of Agriculture Rural Affairs and also Crop Life Canada are really concerned about drift that happens in the field. So it's been over a year now. We've been, we've been talking for a while. And uh, so we finally said we got to do something to help everybody be aware because we found out that there's lots of resources, but it's all over the place. So wouldn't it be nice if we had one spot where, you know, if you had questions about drift, you could go to one location, probably find things you didn't know existed. And actually, I had tested this with a few farmers, and uh, they actually came back and said, oh, wow, I didn't know some of these resources were available. I thought you kind of neat they have it in one spot. And uh, we can find some stuff that uh, actually I could find very useful. So really encouraged by, you know, the current response we've had from uh, some people that, you know what, at first we were, it's like, oh, no, not another website, right? But it's more than just a website. It's kind of a repository of some great information that's coming from a lot of great people who have studied drift and, and a lot of other, you know, there's some companies, some tools, there's all kinds of things in there. And, and it's really great that people can go to one spot and find out some information so they can, you know, protect themselves, but also protect others around them. Because sometimes it's just, oh, I forgot, or I'm in a hurry and I, I need to understand uh, you know, whether this is an inversion or not, and where do I find that? And it's like, you know, what if we can just think about in the season about be drift aware, go on your phone or your computer and just double check, and, and it's really supposed to be a real quick, handy resource for, for farmers and applicators as well. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And and to that point, things like an inversion or, you know, how windy is too windy or how calm is too calm, those sorts of things. But then, of course, there's there's more in there that sort of speaks more broadly about um, about drift risk and, and some of the things, like you mentioned, that you may not think of necessarily off the top of your head. So it does create sort of one place that, that people can go and look into some of these things. There's also a quiz, which I think I like quizzes. Um, so there's some quizzes about, you know, some of the things that you should know. Yeah. Did you, did you, did you pass this quiz? This is a very important question. Well, when we were kind of designing it, I kind of first did it. There's like a trick question in there. And it was like, oh, I knew the answer, but so there it is. It's not like the easiest thing, but, um, hopefully for a lot of farmers, you can just kind of test yourself. Mm -hmm. And then if you are kind of stumbling on them, you say, well, I really don't know. The information is there at the website. That's right. Yeah. 
Right. And so and that that is one of the key parts here is, you know, if if you take a quiz like that and, and you don't you know, know all the answers, the it's a great way to sort of dig into some of the resources and see, you know, what the answer should be and why, uh, for sure. Now, um, there's also this is part of sort of a, a larger discussion on on some of the things that farmers should be thinking about uh, with spray application. Uh, there's be size aware, be height aware, be wind aware. How do these three sort of play in together on the on the spray front and on on the farming operations that are going to happen in the year ahead? Yeah, it's great that it kind of uh, outlines different areas so, you know, farmers and, and applicators can kind of really focus on different things that they're concerned about. And, you know, that there is a difference between height and where you have the bloom and what your target crop is and what you're trying to spray and how your pattern, your spray pattern occurs and, and what can happen to the particles. And same the size of where, right, with the different nozzles that you're using, what's the size of the particles that's coming out of your sprayer. And wind, of, of course, you know, you need to make sure that the wind is a different direction, it, at the certain speeds, um, there's there's a lot of things to consider. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Okay, so for farmers who are curious or agronomists or spray applicators who may be curious as to uh, where they could go for this information, what is the website uh, that we can direct them to? Bedriftaware.ca, mm-hmm. and just how it's spelled, B-E-D-R-I-F-T-A-W-A-R-E.ca. All right, so be drift aware. Dot CA. All right, Marty, uh, before I let you go, um, with the Grain Farmers of Ontario, of course, this is a very busy time of year, a very exciting time of year. Um, just quickly, what are you hearing from farmers as far as some of the bigger concerns or, or questions that they have? Is it all about how early is too early or how is it looking right now? Well, it's commodity prices, but, but uh, <laughs> as, as far as the temperature is so variable right now, I think as we're talking, Lindsay, there's like big storm warnings coming up. There uh, are. I think yeah. for the Guelph area coming up here shortly in the next day or two. So, um, yeah, the, the weather is variable. Actually, I'm really impressed with a lot of farmers. We had some really warm weather. I think people were itching to get out there, but getting equipment ready is the first thing. Um, and we know we're looking at the calendar, too, and uh, it's really turned cold, like weather does go up and down. So, uh, but in my area, a lot of wheat's looking pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's looking like a nice spring. We just need kind of the weather to stabilize and give us some dry conditions so we can hopefully try something in April. The end of April would be nice to start yeah. doing some planting, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. End of April's fine. Early April's not. Yes. Let's just focus on it. Okay, Marty, <laughs> thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Lindsay. Before we take a break, a quick reminder that for every acre you work, Coke Agronomic Services has an answer to help. From nitrogen protection to micronutrients and seed enhancers, discover a portfolio of solutions designed to solve the problems you face. Find your answer at cokeag.ca. That's K-O-C-H-A-G dot C-A. We're going to take a quick break here on Rural Radio Channel 147. I'll be back with more of Real Ag Radio right after this. FP Genetics relentlessly brings innovative new seed genetics to Canadian farms, ensuring growers, breeders, and farmers are supported and viable. Being a valued partner on your farm for decades, you can expect the continuous pursuit of the best genetics. Visit fpgenetics.ca to discover FP's strong portfolio of wheat, durum, barley, oats, peas, and rye, or contact your local FP seed dealer or territory manager to discuss your certified seed strategy specific to your region. Before you get back in the field this year, spend some time with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. Get all the information you need on hybrid selection, planting depth, crop inputs, and more from a wide range of industry experts. A massive library of video content is available on demand when you need it most. Spend your time outside of the field, inside the classroom with the Corn School on realagriculture.com. If you have a growing list of questions about getting more from your fields, know that Coke Agronomic Services has an answer for every acre. With a full spectrum of nutrient management, nutrient protection, and seed enhancement options, Coke Agronomic Services offers a deep portfolio of agronomically effective products, each designed to enhance yield potential, all available to help solve your problems. Find the answer that's right for your acres. Start by visiting cokeag.ca. That's K-O-C-H ag dot C-A.
Welcome back to Real Ag Radio here on this Tuesday, April 2nd. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and we've got an important notice for grain farmers. The Canadian Grain Commission has revoked the licenses of Zager Seed Incorporated, also known as Zagers Canada. If this company owes you money for grain deliveries, please call 1-800-853-6705 immediately. This is a message from the Government of Canada. All right, we go now to Paul Bullock. He's a senior scholar with the Department of Soil Science at the University of Manitoba. And we're talking about Fusarium head blight. So that seems a bit strange. Paul, welcome here. Oh, great to be on, Lindsay. (laughs) Okay, we're not really talking about Fusarium head blight, the disease, because, of course, that isn't your uh, area of expertise. We are talking about the weather that can impact Fusarium head blight, and about the weather stations we need to make forecasting maps. So, Paul, catch us up. There's a there's a project underway. What is this project? Who's involved? Okay, so the the project is actually a continuation uh, of some work that was done uh, from 2018 to through 2023, and the focus of that research project was to um, develop, identify the weather factors, and develop risk uh, algorithms that would help predict when fusarium head blight would be more or less severe. Okay. So uh, that was um, that involved plot sites across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Um, and, and then we tested those, those, the models that we developed from the plots, we tested in farmers' fields, you know, uh, 300 farmer fields, again, spread across the three prairie provinces. And based on that, um, what we were able to do is come up with disease risk models. There's actually a, a, a series of them, and, and they do um, uh, different types of things. They look at the risk for what type of fusarium head blight you would see in the field when the crop is, is still standing. Um, we were able to do uh, a couple of models for fusarium damaged kernels mm. in, in the spring wheat in the Durham. And then we were able to do in Durham also to develop uh, a risk for uh, high levels of uh, dawn in, yeah. in, uh, as well. So, so this yeah, looks at spring wheat, at winter wheat, barley, and Durham. Those are the four crops. And those are the types of risks that we're able to uh, we were able to develop models for in that project. So the other piece of this was that we wanted the, the knowledge and information that we developed to be available, to be able to be used for uh, management decisions across the prairies. And um, so uh, to, in order to do that, uh, we, we contracted um, help with the developing a, a website, <clears throat> an online mapping tool, and and that's um, you know it's been developed. It's actually been operational uh, for us to work with in a testing mode now uh, for a couple of years, and uh, we're ready to have this roll out to the public. And and so this project that we're talking about right now is meant to roll out across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba be available publicly uh, free of charge to anyone who wants to use it Um, and it's going to actually replace um, what you find for fusarium risk maps individually in each province okay so manitoba saskatchewan and alberta have all had fusarium risk maps in the past now these these ran on models that were developed in the united states and were kind of imported here and what we found is that the models that we developed right here in Western Canada worked more accurately than the ones that were imported, which isn't really a big surprise. We kind of expected that would be the case. Mm-hmm. And so, so this spring, uh, you know, when people go to, say, Saskatchewan's um, fusarium risk map, they'll still find uh, uh, risk information, but it's going to link up to this new uh, tool that we've developed and um, uh, so what, what we need is we need weather data to feed those risk algorithms and then the mapping allows people to see, uh, like if you go there on June the 1st, it'll tell you what the risk was up until the previous day in terms of the weather conditions for creating fusarium. 
So and that's that's a key part here is that in order to inform this tool, the forecasting tool and, and it be this sort of, you know, almost by the day risk forecasting, you do need to be gathering significant amount of data from multiple points. And that's one of the reasons right. we're talking today is that Alberta, yeah. Manitoba, for the most part, is is covered as far as weather stations, but there's a bit of a gap, pardon the pun, um, in Saskatchewan as far yeah. as as these weather stations go. Um, and there's an opportunity potentially, uh, depending on where a farmer is located, that they could have a weather station provided. So tell me about that aspect of this project. Right. Yeah, that's very important. The uh, in Saskatchewan, we just just don't have the same number of publicly accessible weather stations. Alberta and Manitoba both have a provincial weather network that is pub- publicly accessible. Uh, Saskatchewan has lots of weather stations, but a lot of them are privately held. And so that creates an issue with trying to access those types of data to use in the tool, um, you know, when it's in private hands. So, so this is the opportunity. Um, we've, we've got um, some uh, weather stations. Uh, the, these are METOS or, or, PESSL, P-E-S-S-L, weather stations. We, had, we have 25 of them that we're actually distributing uh, free of charge. Uh, we're looking for strategic locations where we could mm-hmm. set up one of those stations to fill a, a large gap in the coverage. So that's, that's the, the one thing. And, and yes, there's been people have started to, to contact me uh, about it. And, and actually some of those stations have actually been allocated to people who are in uh, strategic location. So uh, we still have more that we need to do, uh, but that was the first piece of it. Um, but also, um, there are many people that already have a Metos weather station in Saskatchewan. And uh, all they need to do uh, is to provide permission for us to use their data and we can, uh, we can uh, assimilate that and, and use it in the model and that, what that does is it provides more, more points on the map where we can calculate that weather-based risk. And then the, the, the map itself just has higher spatial resolution. It's, it's a more accurate depiction mm-hmm. of where the risk is higher or lower. So, so that's the other thing. So you can, you can have existing uh, station owners uh, on the METOS network. Uh, METOS has something called Ag Data Transparency Certification. They do not share weather data unless they have specific written permission to do so. Um, and so it's just a matter of reaching out to those people who may have a METOS weather station and, and, and uh, asking them they can contact METOS and say, yeah, we'd be quite willing to uh, let the, uh, this online mapping tool have access to those data. And that adds another point in Saskatchewan. Okay, so very important then for uh, producers hearing this that may want to see if they would uh, they would be eligible for a free station, they can get in touch. But those that already have this particular type uh, certainly could uh, allow their information to be used, that weather information to be used to inform this map as well. So definitely uh, a lot of a lot of opportunity to participate here. Now, I did want to just quickly note uh, this is it's quite the collaboration here. We've got the University of Manitoba, Sasquatch. Alberta Grains, the Manitoba Crop Alliance, and all three prairie provinces, uh, the governments of all three prairie provinces involved in this project and putting this together. So it, it's quite a feat. Um, and it, I've got notes here that says uh, the forecasting map, May 15th to August 31st. Is that, that's when, that's, right. that's when these would be published or, or you could access <laughs> an up, right. updated map during that time? An updated map. That's right. Yeah. So, so um, <clears throat> what would happen is that the, 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 risk, the risk mapping tool, it, it uses the previous, depending on which model you're talking about, whether it's DAWN or FDK or, or, or the, the Fusarium index in the field, they, it uses weather data from the previous either 10 days or 14 days. And so on May the 15th, it will, it will use the data from May 1st to the 14th and it will calculate a risk value at every okay. weather station. Mm-hmm. So that's why, yeah, so we're, you know, we want to ingest the weather data from, from May 1st to August 31st. And, and then that provides these risk maps during that period from the 15th through to the end of August. Right. So that's, that's the reason for those dates. And yeah, uh, you know, when you bring the tool up that 
the first thing it, it does, it, it defaults to the current day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if that's what you want. Most people, that's what they're going to yes, want. Yeah. You, you can go back in time too, but, but the current day is mostly what they will want. They, what kind of crop do you have? Is it spring wheat? Is it winter wheat? What are you interested in? What variety? Because they have different yes. fusarium uh, resistance levels. Uh, and, then, and then depending, if you select uh, spring wheat, for example, it'll give you a choice. You can either get a fusarium risk map, what, what you think it's going to look like in the field of, of fusarium head blight index, or you can get uh, an FDK, what, what, what you would expect for risk for fusarium damage kernels. So you, you select all of those things and click and away it goes. And in the background, all this magic happens with these algorithms mm-hmm. that take the weather data at all these stations and creates a map. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you can zoom into that uh, to have a closer look at your area and that sort of thing. It doesn't go to a field level. Right. Uh, I need to be really right. clear that this is not going to tell you on the southwest of 23, blah, 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 it's right. going to be high risk. It, 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 the, the grid is 10 by 10 kilometers. So, so each grid cell, there's, yeah. a, there's an actual uh, risk done for each grid cell. And, still, and that's, that's as high as resolution we're going to. Yeah, yeah still, that's pretty good. Realistically, oh, oh, yeah, I still yeah, think like, that's yeah, quite good. Does. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you're when you're standing back and looking at this at a, on a regional basis. Yeah. It gives you a, quite a bit of detail about where the hot spots are and, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, it, it, it does quite well. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're you know, what we want this to do is to say, wow, I'm sitting in an area that's high risk. I better go and have a look at my field because yeah. I may need to put on a fungicide. And the, and the thing is, the risk that it's going to pump out, it's, it's calculating the risk up to the time of flowering. This is when, right. this is when uh, you know, fusarium becomes a problem is, is right at flowering. If you're going to spray, you have to do that around the time of anthesis to be effective, right? Mm-hmm. Putting yeah. a fungicide on two weeks later or three weeks later when you can already see the fusarium showing up, well, it's too late. It's not going to do anything. So that's the main purpose for this is to help better inform fungicide application as a way to help control the level of fusarium when mm-hmm. the risk is high. And if the risk isn't high, well, then why, you know, why would you put on a fungicide? It's, it's, it's not going to gain mm-hmm. you very much. So, so that's the whole purpose for this. Mm-hmm. And also, I, I like that it includes that variety of choice, because obviously we know there's going to be different risk levels. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, most farmers, of course, are going to know that, but it's, it's certainly nice to have that worked into the equation for sure. Um, and the dawn, one thing that I find interesting, of course, is that there is the forecast mapping of uh, that you said in the earlier project that w- looked at actually dawn development as well, which is of course what fusarium creates um, and yeah, and makes yeah. it you know such a detriment for feed. So so super cool. Okay, so Paul, before I let you go, we need to connect people. So of course they can contact me and I can put them in touch. But Paul, if someone wants to know if they can perhaps uh, access one of these uh, one of these stations or wants more information, uh, where can they go to find that out? And then where can they actually access uh, this tool? Mm-hmm. Right, right. And so um, the so let's uh, let's break it down then. So if you're an existing Meta station owner, um, you, you send your your station ID and contact information and that to to sales at metos dot um, okay. And 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 there, yeah, that information would be enough for them to say, okay, we have we can get permission and we'll we'll get that um, uh, data added. If they're interested in one of the free stations, I encourage them to have a look. We've, we've listed the locations that we're looking for, these free weather stations. And if they're near one of those locations, um, then yes, they can contact me. And that's uh, paul.bullock, B-U-L-L-O-C-K, at umanitoba.ca. Okay. And uh, yeah, the people have been contacting me. And as I said, we're, we're starting to allocate these stations. So, uh, but we need, we need more yet. So that'd be great if they would do that. Um, the, the actual tool itself will be released. We're expecting to release this in May uh, this year. So it's not publicly accessible at this point in time but we expect it will be accessible to the world um, in, in May of 2024. Okay. It's coming up soon. Month to go. Yes, it is. Crunch oh, yeah. time. The, the, push, the push is on. You bet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, Paul, thank you so much. And, of course, anyone out there, if you if you get in touch with us here at Real Agriculture, we'll connect you as well. So uh, by all means. But, Paul, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. 
All right. Thanks very much, Lindsay. It's time for a quick break, and I will be back with more of Real Egg Radio right after this. If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. Get all the information you need to keep your pulse crop healthy and profitable with the Pulse School on realagriculture.com. The Pulse School is a free YouTube video series covering agronomy, research, and more across a host of different pulse crops. It's also available as an audio podcast wherever you download or stream your favorite podcast. Check us out on YouTube or visit realagriculture.com, the Pulse School, brought to you by BSF Canada. Back to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio Channel 147. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and cattle markets are destined to rise and fall. Make sure you're protected from unexpected price drops with livestock price insurance. Price protection for calves is available now through to June 13th. For more information, visit lpi.ca. All right, as promised, I've got a clip for you here from this is the March 21st edition of The Agronomist. And you can always head to realagriculture.com slash agronomist and you can see all of the past episodes we've done. Um, We're on episode 147 now, so there are plenty to choose from. But this is just a clip from that March 21st episode where we talked about saving nitrogen. So all the ways in which we lose nitrogen and all the ways in which we can save it. And fascinating discussion. uh, Was absolutely thrilled to have John Lazon from the University of Guelph and Bryce Geisel on as well uh, to talk about, you know, considerations for nitrogen rates, uh, form, and using those enhanced efficiency fertilizers in the right place at the right time. Here's a clip from the agronomists. Two. Okay, so let's move into then. Um, and, and John and Bryce, I'll, I'll sort of go to each of you. Bryce, maybe I'll go to you first. Thinking in the Western Canadian context, which of the lost pathways are we typically dealing with or which are the two that we're most concerned about? So it really kind of depends on the time year and the application. So it kind of does have to go back to the four R's, right? We always have to swing back to the to the four R's. Um, but the two that we're kind of most focused on in the prairies is that volatilization. So, you know, potentially shallow banded, but broadcast at any time that urea is close to the surface. That's when volatil- volatilization is going to happen. And that's when we can see a big loss of that. Um, the other one's the denitrification. And that kind of happens in the spring after a snow melt. So that's kind of a big one, especially for anyone who's doing fall applications that we know from an efficiency standpoint, you know, just trying to get those acres across and the amount of product down, uh, you know, fall application is definitely a growing application. Um, and so when that nitrogen is sitting there, if it gets all the way to nitrate, by the time, you know, the freeze up happens and then the spring, we get that saturated soil from the snow melt. Usually, maybe not this year, we'll have to see how it works from this standpoint with the lack of snow. But um, normally, uh, we get those wet soils and we get that denitrification. That's when we see that big spike of that is usually in the spring snow melt. Now, John, on the Ontario side, is perhaps somewhat of a different picture in that we we aren't putting nitrogen on in the fall. I mean, we may be putting manure on or, or other things. Um, are we mostly worried about volatilization, but we also have tile drainage. Do we need to worry more about leaching in the Ontario context? Yeah, if you look at the difference between the Prairie Provinces and Ontario and all of Eastern Canada, for that matter, is the amount of precipitation we have and the amount of excess water. In the case of the prairies, they've got that little window in the spring where there's meltwater, plus the early part of the summer is a little bit rainier than the rest of the year. Ontario is different. Same amount of rainfall or precipitation pretty much every month of the year. What changes the amount that is extra is the amount of evapotranspiration potential. So spring and fall and winter tend to be our times where leaching and denitrification have the greatest possibility just because of that water budget. Now, in terms of what's most important, volatilization can happen really quick and we can lose a lot of N here in Ontario or anywhere in Canada for that matter through volatilization within a week or so. 
And so that's still a major economic one. But if you're talking about which one is most important, that depends on your perspective. Denitrification uh, quite often may not account for a huge volume of N, but the problem with it, one of the forms of N that can be lost is nitrous oxide, which probably a lot of you've heard uh, through those targets that the federal government's trying to come up with, um, is a, a very potent greenhouse gas, about 300 times that of CO2. Yeah. And so it could be an important one in terms of environmental interest. Leaching as well, we used to hear about that more in terms of nitrate and groundwater, and we can get a heck of a lot of that here too, but we can minimize it by doing some of the things that we're going to be talking about. That's right. I like this foreshadowing, John. You're very good at it. Um, so, so it is true though, and, and that is, you know, one of the considerations and one of the discussions we've had on this show many times is, you know, the, the volatilization loss as pounds of nitrogen may not necessarily be the most significant, but obviously from an environmental perspective, it is by far the most significant. So we do need to consider that, but it is going to depend on, on conditions, obviously. So let's, um, let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's talk about conditions. Uh, we've mentioned some of them here, but let's talk a little bit about conditions that are perhaps more conducive, um, to loss. And Bryce, you've covered some of them, um, with the denitrification. You did mention, though, of course, and for most of the prairie people, it has been dry, dry, dry. Has that made the nitrogen question and the nitrogen loss question an easier one to answer, or does it create its own set of concerns? It definitely has its own set of concerns. Like that's going to be kind of a change in the years that we typically see. So again, you know, for, for us in the prairies, uh, volatilization is going to be the big concern. And that's kind of that anything that's broadcast, it's at the soil surface. Um, whether it's broadcasting urea or, you know, putting on UAN through, uh, streamer nozzles or, or dribble bands. Um, so keeping it close to the surface. Uh, if we don't get that moisture, that rainfall to help get that nitrogen down where it's into the, soil safer because we're not using tillage in the prairies we're relying on moisture to try to push that nitrogen down to keep it safe if it's sitting there on the surface or even shallow banding um i know that's kind of inconclusive uh, in some research and stuff but you know historically we have seen some shallow banding losses of, with volatilization um just because we're not putting that nitrogen very deep so if we have those dry conditions and that nitrogen staying close to that surface or on the surface that does put us at a real big risk of having some volatilization losses this year. So um, hopefully we'll, everyone will get those good rains this spring and we won't be have, have to worry about that, but I think it is something we have to be considering going into, into spring. With those dry conditions though, are farmers, are you seeing an increase in broadcasting because we don't want to be disturbing the soil as much because of the, the drying losses or have you, have you noticed any changes in approaches in that, in that sense? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we've definitely seen some changes. So we're seeing a, a swing in towards more broadcasting. Um, I think there's all, probably the biggest driver is an efficiency standpoint, just the amount of product uh, to go through and, and put that out onto fields. Um, you can definitely uh, float it on a lot faster than you can put it on through your air seeder. Uh, so that is something that is happening. Um, I, there's still a lot obviously going on. The bulk is still getting put on shallow banded with air seeders, whether it's side banding or mid-roll banding, whichever uh, equipment people you have um, but definitely seeing that uptake both in the fall and the spring um, just from that efficiency standpoint so I think that is something to be concerned about obviously from a spring broadcasting that's where volatilization is going to be a concern going into this spring anything that was done last fall already so we're kind of going in the past here uh, hopefully it was uh, stabilized and uh, that's going to help reduce those volatilization losses um, but if you just use the single inhibitor you know you could be potentially uh, at risk for some of those denitrification losses if we get some saturated soils kind of after the snow melt we could still get some snow you know we tend to see one big snowfall coming around easter usually so we'll see if we get that again or not so uh... john your thoughts well i think if you bring up my slide one it might help to explain why some of the things that bryce said are, are true uh, and so what we're looking at here are the factors that affect volatilization rate and remember what we're talking about uh, ammonia and ammonium are one hydrogen apart, if you like. Ammonium has a nitrogen with four hydrogens on it. Ammonia, the gas, only has three. Mm. The distinction between the two is based on the pH of the system. 
As pH increases, becomes more basic, ammonium is converted to ammonia. But it's not until the pH reaches the high sevens that we have any ammonia that's present at all. As the pH increases above that, at about a pH of 9.2, there's equal quantities of both ammonium and ammonia, and above 9.2, mostly ammonia. And so it, it makes you wonder right off the bat, why do we have any volatilization at all? Because most of our soil pHs aren't anywhere near that range, and they aren't. The highest the pH of our soils here in, in southern Ontario and the ones that are in the bulk of the prairies can be is about 8.2 given the geology of the area. But most of them are lower than that. And so we don't tend to see a lot of ammonia loss on its own. That's where urea comes into the picture. When urea enters the environment, there is an enzyme that causes hydrolysis to occur. And that hydrolysis not only releases ammonium into the soil, but it also causes the pH to go up around that urea granule or around that liquid in 28%. That pH isn't going to be enough to change the bulk pH of the soil, but right around that granule, right where the ammonium is released, the pH goes up and so ammonia can be formed under those conditions. Whether it's lost or not is dependent on some of the other factors that I'm going to look at in a second. The second one down the list is the buffer capacity of the soil. Soils have a, an ability to resist pH change. And that's largely dependent on the cation exchange capacity of the soil. So that negative charge, it can hold hydrogen, a positive charge, out of solution. And so it doesn't add to the pH. And so the greater the amount of organic matter in the soil and the greater the amount of clay, the greater the buffer capacity or the less that pH is going to jump when that urea hydrolyzes. So on a really sandy low pH or low organic matter soil, pH may jump quite a bit, at least in that localized area. Talked about it being a biological process, so temperature is going to be very important. As temperature increases, the rate of loss is going to increase as well. And so here in southern Ontario, when we apply urea to the surface in winter wheat ground, for instance, it's cold and it's wet. Uh, that process happens over a long period of time and we don't see that much loss. But now you move a little bit further into spring around corn planting time where the soil's a little bit warmer and losses can be much greater. We heard something about moisture. That process needs water to happen, but if we've got some rain or very wet conditions, it will cause that granule to mix into a larger volume of soil and as such, buffer the pH down more so it doesn't go up high enough that you would tend to get a lot of loss. And we hear Bryce talk about that mixing in the soil. That's what we're looking at there. If there's a rainfall after the urea goes on the ground, then it mixes it in and we tend to see less loss. Right, big thank you to Bryce Geisel with Coke Agronomic Services and John Lazon for joining me there on The Agronomist. Uh, I do appreciate it. It's a fascinating discussion. Check it out. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break and I'll be back with the news right after this. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of The Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, On The Soybean School will bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. Peter Johnson at WheatPeatRealAgriculture.com and what an opportunity! Oh my gosh! You think you can't grow better wheat? You are absolutely wrong. We're going to show you how to strive for those record wheat yields that they get in the UK and in New Zealand. You can grow 150 bushel wheat. I'll show you how. Catch Wheat Pete's Word every Wednesday on RealAgriculture.com or download the podcast on iTunes or Spotify. Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here on April 2nd. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. And from nutrient management to the latest weather, market and ag trends, the dirt, an economics podcast is your place for farm smart topics to boost your profitability. Join Mike Howell on season three of the dirt podcast available now at nutrient-economicswithak.com. 
All right, as promised, I did say I would get you some news. So we've got uh, some not great news on the highly pathogenic avian influenza front. Uh, so as we've been keeping you up to date, we have not had any confirmed cases in dairy cattle or other species beyond poultry or birds at this time in Canada. However, we do have several positive cases in the United States. We also uh, heard today, and this is on AgWeb, uh, where we have confirmed one person who has tested positive for HPAI. Um, they are suspecting that it was caught from the dairy cattle. This is someone who was in close contact with the cattle. Uh, they were not very ill. However, they did test positive. This is, of course, a very uh, scary turn of events, not entirely uh, unexpected. However, it's definitely not a positive thing. Anytime that a virus is adapting to either be more virulent, so meaning it can infect more species or infect more uh, easily potentially, or if it can adapt and then spread within that species after entering one, like we've seen with potentially cow to cow transfer, they're not ruling that out just yet. Uh, and now we have a human who has contracted it potentially from the cattle. So all of this is very troubling. Um, however, the USDA, APHIS, all the official word is that at this point, this is something that's being monitored and tested. Um, and at this point, there absolutely is no risks to the public or to consuming dairy products. We want to make that very clear. However, it does very much bring up the, um, the point of biosecurity on all farms, but especially poultry farms. And really, if you think about it, if we know that cattle can be infected by HPAI, it likely means that if you are a dairy farmer in Canada, you should be reviewing your biosecurity protocols and recognizing the risk factors. And frankly, we are in the spring migration. Uh, these birds that are carrying HPAI are going to be flying overhead. Um, and so there is an increased risk potentially of exposure. So absolutely, this is a time to be reviewing what you could be doing on your farms for biosecurity to potentially minimize the contact that livestock may have uh, with bird feces, which we know can spread if the disease is there, can spread highly pathogenic avian influenza. All right, staying in the U.S. and staying actually with a story from AgWeb. It's Chris Bennett that shared this one. Uh, there's a really great story. I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, we've got a farmer in Iowa who decided to get creative in evaluating whether or not a fungicide pass would pay in its cornfield. So this farmer decided to write a script um, to not spray fungicide in a pattern in a cornfield spelling out the words, does it pay? So the does it pay in the cornfield did not receive fungicide, the rest of the field did. And clear as day, you can see from the maps uh, that Iowa farmer Travis McCormick shares in the story on AgWeb, uh, it definitely did pay. There was a 25 bushel difference, which of course is not necessarily uh, one that they'll recommend you expect from a fungicide pass. However, in this case, obviously things lined up that that pass was definitely worth it in this cornfield. Uh, but certainly pretty cool to see the does it pay, you know, just clear as day on those maps within even just a week or two after applying that fungicide on the corn crop. So uh, a lot of fun and kind of neat. And certainly I will say this. So here's the cool thing in the actual sort of a bit of science behind this. One of the things that farmers often are encouraged to do is leave a test strip or replicate a trial, try and take into consideration variability within the field and try and capture, you know, the actual differences between, let's say, treated and untreated or sprayed and unsprayed. The great thing about doing something like this is that, you know, Travis made a prescription that put does it pay across the field, which meant that it actually covered like a really nice area of the field, meaning it covered a lot of the variability. So that 25 bushel difference is probably pretty accurate, meaning that that fungicide definitely did pay. Um, and so I'm not saying everybody needs to write words in their fields with their sprayer. Um, however, it's a great visual and just a wonderful way to actually evaluate a spray pass. Uh, and hey, it looks pretty cool from the air and from the prescription maps as well. So there you go. Uh, okay, now uh, let's head back to Canada. 
where the Prime Minister is on a bit of a mini campaign, if I may. So Budget Day is coming up in mid-April. I think it's April 14th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, And instead of waiting for Budget Day and, you know, lots of secrets, lots of things wrapped up in the budget, uh, and we don't learn about them till Budget Day, uh, the Liberal government is definitely taking what will be in the budget and using it for these two weeks leading up to it to really get as much as as much media coverage as they can on what they plan to unveil in that budget. So there won't be a lot of surprises, I don't think, in it. And it really does feel a bit like the federal government, uh, the Liberals, are campaigning a bit on this budget. Anyway, uh, in somewhat agricultural-related news, because last time I checked, food is still agriculturally related, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has uh, promised in the next budget that there will be a school food program rolling out in Canada. So this will be a federal program uh, delivered, of course, by the provinces, um, as the provinces are the ones that, of course, deal with uh, education. However, this will be a national food uh, strategy for our schools and making sure that kids uh, have the nutrition they need when they're at school. So many people are coming out in support of this, at least as an idea. Um, Perhaps not surprisingly, though, uh, Pierre Polyev, the leader of the opposition, uh, the leader of the Conservative Party, really brought it back to this is the day after uh, we did see the carbon tax increase on April 1st. And uh, Polyev, of course, linking that to an increased cost of food. So essentially saying that Trudeau is, you know, introducing these, uh, this food for students. uh, But if there was no carbon tax, perhaps that food would be more affordable and more kids could eat at home. I think it's a little simplistic, but that's what the official opposition is coming out with on this front. Let us know what you think. Of course, you can call that Real Ag Feedback Line 855-776-6147, or you can send me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. Okay, sticking with the news, though, there's a few more things. did want to update you, of course, uh, if you've been following along on the Port of Baltimore and, of course, the Dolly, the ship that uh, crashed into and ruined a gigantic bridge. Um, it seems that the Port of Virginia is taking much of the diverted cargo from the Port of Baltimore. Um, and so that was one of the questions of, you know, what happens in the interim while they're cleaning up this absolute disaster. It's going to take weeks, like absolutely weeks to uh, clean up. And realistically, right now, as far as I understand it, uh, they're really trying to focus on one laneway to try and get a lane open for shipping traffic. Uh, But in the meantime, the Port of Virginia is taking a lot of it. So uh, this is, we know the Port of Baltimore, incredibly important to the equipment world, uh, a lot of fertilizer, and yes, some grain moves through the Port of Baltimore for agriculture. Also possibly of interest, if you're into this sort of thing, uh, the company that uh, the shipping company that has the boat that was doing the shipping is trying to limit its damages to 44 million. Um, So all I can say is this is going to get pretty ugly, I would think, between insurance this and insurance that and who actually is going to pay for the cleanup. Um, It's going to be an interesting thing. I know that the U.S., of course, the government has come out to say that they are going to assist in that. But ultimately, who ends up paying for it? It's going to be an interesting one. Okay, uh, let's leave it there for now. There's, of course, lots of other things going on. If if there's something that we've missed that you'd like to see us cover, uh, you can zip me an email, lsmith at realagriculture.com. Of course, you can find us across social media at Real Agriculture. And if you use the hashtag Real Ag Radio, we'll find you even faster. All right, thank you to everyone who joined me on the show. We're going to wrap it up there. I'll be back for the issues panel. Oh, no, I just lied. I'm actually off on Friday. And uh, I don't normally take Fridays off because they are a busy day. And I love the issues panel. I love being here on the show. However, it is time to shear our flock here at home. So we have uh, several hundred sheep that need a haircut. And Friday will be a full pull to get it all done. We've got two shears coming. We've got a team of helpers. Uh, So wish me luck, if you will. Uh, If you follow along on social media, I'm sure you'll see some snaps and some uh, photos and some Instagram reels all about shearing. It is a lot of work, but it sure does look nice when they've all got their haircuts. Alrighty, so with that, I'll leave you in Sean's capable hands for the rest of the week. And uh, I'll be back next week, of course, for Tuesdays with Lindsay. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this Feel Like Radio podcast brought to you by high-performing carbine insecticide from FMC. 
carbine insecticide hits aphids hard with effective selective extended control. It also has activity on ligus and tarnished plant bugs. Ask your retailer today.